here. Good afternoon. My name is Chris Sorrow. I'm one of the senior portfolio managers here at Probity Advisors. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to our 2012 speaker series hosted in partnership with the NCPA. Uh, for those of you that are not familiar with the NCPA, it stands for the National Center for Policy Analysis. And while you may not be familiar with the NCPA by name, uh, you're most likely very familiar with their legislative accomplishments. They are responsible for the Roth IRA, health savings accounts, qualified default investment options, and a variety of Social Security, health care, and entitlement reform programs. The NCPA is a nonpartisan and nonprofit independent, independent research organization. And what I'm so impressed with them about is that they're able to draw from researchers and academics on both sides of the aisle to help promote their, their case before the legislature in the U.S. Congress. Uh, and so while it's easy to think about the coming election as maybe your only opportunity to express your political views or maybe your, your particular motives, uh, it's important to understand that the NCPA is an ongoing and consistent voice in making sure that free market principles are continuing, continuing to be represented in Washington, D.C. And so I hope uh, if you agree with the views being expressed today and some of the ideas that are being shared, that as you walk out, you'll consider leaving your business card and we can get you on the NCPA's mailing list. So today's discussion is really an extension of a dialogue that we started back in January about macroeconomic policy and its impact on financial markets. And we were honored to have Dr. John Goodman join us in January, where he spoke about his fiscal policy concerns, specifically about health care and the impact that is going to have on the increasing uh, federal budget and the federal deficit. Uh, uh, you know, today we shift our attention from fiscal policy concerns, and we now shift that over to monetary policy concerns. And to help us with that, we have uh, Dr. Bob McTeer with us, who's a distinguished fellow at the NCPA. Uh, Bob is perhaps best known for his 36-year career at the Dallas Federal Reserve, uh, where he served as president of the Dallas Federal Reserve Bank and was a member of the Federal Open Market Committee. And just a few days ago, we released our primer on the uh, uh, federal banking system, Federal Reserve, and our banking system as a whole. And if you had an opportunity to listen to that, you'll understand just how influential Bob has been in, in affecting monetary policy and economic outcomes. Bob has been an outspoken advocate for free markets. He's been a strong and at times dissenting voice to the business as usual attitude inside Washington, D.C. And I can assure you just by having a, a brief moment with him on the side, he's not afraid to speak his views when it comes to free markets and, and, and the economy. Outside of the government, Bob has been served on a board of a major bank. He has served as the chancellor of Texas A&M. And perhaps most appealing to my particular views, he received his doctorate degree from the University of Georgia in economics. So go dogs. Uh, just a quick note about the format today. Uh, we're trying to make this as informal and interactive as possible. So only about half of our time is going to be spent with prepared remarks, and the other half is going to be spent receiving questions from, from, from the audience. So we have a mic microphone that we'll be passing around, and I believe we've left some pens and, and paper on, on the table. So if, this, if we go through today, if you'll start making some notes, the idea is to make this as interactive and an exchange as possible. Uh, but, you know, in that spirit, let me just say that uh, I'm going to go ahead and ask the question to Bob that, that I'm sure is on everybody's mind is, which given that he's, he's been chancellor of Texas A&M and he went to University of Georgia and they're now in the same conference, who are you going to root for when they play each other in the title game? Georgia. <laughs> All right. Good odds. <laughs> So Bob is always educational, he's always entertaining, and we really appreciate him being here to speak on our behalf today. With that, would you please welcome Bob McTeer. Thank you, Chris. It's a pleasure to be with all of you today. Um, I don't know if he used the word think tank in connection with uh, NCPA, but I like to think of it as a free market think tank, and <clears throat> I tell people that I'm a writer, speaker, and part-time thinker. Uh, I think I, I've labeled my remarks today a tale of two economies. Uh, you know there are two ways of viewing the economy, my way and the other way. My way is from the big picture perspective, from the macroeconomic uh, perspective. And from that viewpoint, the economy is just muddling along. The recovery is way too slow, 
GDP growth is subpar, employment growth is subpar. Our fiscal situation continues to be a mess. We're not in a fiscal crisis at the moment in this country only because the bond vigilantes are occupied elsewhere uh, at the moment on the plains in Spain. Um, it's kind of amazing that two or three days ago we had a terrible stock market day because of a bond auction in Spain, and yesterday we had a good one because of another treasury bill auction in Spain. And who, who would have thunk it that uh, the conditions on the plains in Spain would, uh, would affect us so directly? Long term, our entitlement programs are unsustainable. If you came to John's lecture, I'm sure you got a load of that. Short term, there's a new word, taxageddon, looms at year end when uh, sequestration kicks in. Unless our politicians can agree to a fiscal fix, and there's nothing in their recent performance that offers any hope on that score. Now, that's one way of viewing the economy. The other way, at ground level, uh, you can view the economy company by company, or big company by big company, and many of those are doing very well. Thank you. Uh, they've lightened their debt load during this period of crisis and uh, recession and slow recovery. They've hoarded cash, become much more liquid. They've become more productive and more profitable. And in many cases, many of them are creating jobs, only elsewhere, not necessarily in this country. Now that second view of the economy may be more relevant for selective investors. All you guys out there have to worry about these days is the Buffett rule. You got a little relief on that this week, but it'll come back. Not to mention higher taxes on capital gains and dividends, which I think are inevitable. The only question is how much higher. Now, I'm not an expert in, uh, in that world. I'm not an expert in investments. I got all my investment knowledge from Will Rogers. I follow his philosophy. And his philosophy is this. You buy your stock, and when it goes up, sell it. And if it don't go up, don't buy it. <laughs> Admittedly, that may be a little easier said than done, and that's where our hosts come in to help with that. But back to, uh, back to my world. For some perspective, we had 18 months of deep recession up to mid-2009. Our 34th month of weak recovery, 34 and counting, almost three years of subpar recovery. Now the last quarter we have GDP numbers for is the fourth quarter of last year, and it didn't sound too bad, 3% uh, annual rate. However, unlike Wagner's music, it wasn't as good as it sounded. You know, they say Wagner's music was better than it sounds, but the G GDP number was worse than it sounds because out of that 3% growth, over two-thirds of it was inventory accumulation. And if you take that out, the growth would have been only 1.1% and would have been less than the previous quarter's growth. There's no real momentum there. Employment growth was doing better for three or four months uh, than GDP growth, but then last month we had another disappointment in March of weak employment growth, which led to the worst stock market week that we've had so far this year. The unemployment rate has come down to 8.2%, but that's largely because labor force dropouts are not counted as unemployed. Uh, if you add in the dropouts that became discouraged and quit looking for work, and you add in the people working part-time that would rather be working full-time, and so forth, add all that back in, and the unemployment rate is pretty much 15%. Now, why has the recovery been so slow? 
The first answer and the conventional wisdom answer these days is that it's slow because it was tri the recession was triggered by a financial crisis. There's an instantly classic book out uh, by Ken Rogoff and Carmen Reinhart titled This Time is Different, which studies eight centuries of financial crises and panics. And its major conclusion is that if a recession begins with a financial panic, it lasts longer. Uh, I was interested to see Ken Rodolph come out with this book. Years, years ago, he and I did a dog and pony show at Barclays in London. And I thought it was a pretty good gig uh, until after, after we finished, they loaded us up in the back seat of the car and, and, and gave us a tour of their various clients. So I think we did about five client pitches in, in one day. So the first reason is the financial crisis. The second reason is that normally you come out of recessions due to the interest sensitive housing sector responding to lower interest rates. And the housing sector has been dead in the water. It just has not been available to respond to the easier monetary policy. That's number two, the housing bust. Now you put those two things together, the financial crisis and what it did to stock prices and then the housing crisis and what it did to home equity. And what you have is a situation where virtually everyone lost wealth. Normally in a recession, the burden is carried almost exclusively by the unemployed, those that lose their jobs and those that cannot find jobs. But the rest of us with jobs aren't harmed very much by recessions. Maybe even help if, they, if the recession lowers the inflation rate. But this time you have that in spades, the unemployed problem, but you have all the rest of us that, pat, that have had wealth destruction. And as we try to restore wealth and liquidity, a lot of the things we do tend to slow down the recovery. Then we have two paradoxes that are holding us back. One of them has a name, it's called the paradox of thrift, and it came from John Maynard Keynes. And it says this, if individuals save more, that's a good thing, uh, but if too many individuals save more at the same time, the economy falls. It's a fallacy of composition. You go to a football game and you can stand up and see better. But if everybody stands up, it doesn't work. Now consumers make up 70 plus percent of total spending that goes into GDP. Virtually every consumer on the planet needs to save more. And a few of them, if they save more, would better their lives. But if you have a general saving more of consumers, it means spending less and the recession deepens. So that's a sort of a paradox that keeps the economy from getting very strong from consumer spending. There's another one that operates on the international trade side and that is exports. Exports generate domestic income, output, and jobs, and exports have been growing. However, when exports grow, imports grow too. And lately, since our weak economy has been doing better than a lot of our trading partners, our imports have been growing faster than our ex exports. Now that's not a bad thing, but it does generate GDP abroad rather than home. So it's sort of an automatic stabilizer that works against the country that's doing better than its trading partners. Uh, I'll call that number five reasons for slow recovery. Number six, I just mentioned massive new regulations and threats of regulations and regulatory agencies that seem to be out of control. Number seven, the threat of higher taxes that's been with us over the last three or four years. Number eight, anti-business rhetoric coming out of Washington, especially banker bashing. Number nine, I guess, is the uh, European albatross. Uh, I mentioned that uh, two big stock days we had lately was based on Spanish uh, bond auctions, of all things. 
The general European solution to their debt crisis is also self-defeating. And I don't have a good recommendation for them unless they have family jewels they can sell. But austerity is hardly a good way to get out of debt if you're a government, because the austerity just puts you deeper in the hole. European austerity is like a debtor's prison. The beatings will continue until morale improves. The beatings will continue until you pay your, your debt. <coughs> now, I'm not a Paul Krugman fan, but he had an article in Monday's New York Times uh, that I agree with, and the title of the article was Europe's Economic Suicide. And he talked about the, uh, uh, the dilemma they have over there. The bright spot in Europe has been that finally, finally, the European Central Bank started to take a page out of the Fed's more aggressive playbook and do some things that have helped. Mainly what they did was they had two rounds of lending to European banks for three years at 1% interest and relaxed collateral requirements. In the first round of that lending, over 500 banks uh, participated. In the second round, over 800 banks participated. So that has been helpful in helping to turn the European situation from an immediate crisis into a longer run chronic condition that maybe we can live with, maybe not. Now, some cynical souls have pointed out that what the uh, ECB has been doing is fighting debt with debt, with more debt. Uh, that's true. Uh, but we tend to accept that sometimes you have to fight fire with fire, right? And some of us even believe a little hair of the dog helps the situation uh, the next morning. But it is true they're fighting debt with debt. Uh, they are fighting sovereign debt with debt to banks. That makes it a little bit different. But uh, Chris didn't mention that I'm a poet. And years ago, I wrote a little poem about fighting debt with debt that uh, didn't apply at the time to European situation. It applied to our own debt culture. I know you're dying to hear this little poem. <laughs> My house is underwater, for sure. My car is upside down, you bet. But I'm getting me a consolidation loan and finally getting out of debt. <laughs> now, I mentioned that the ECB was finally taking a page out of the uh, Fed's aggressive playbook, and the Fed has been very aggressive uh, over the last few years. That gets a lot of criticism. But in my opinion, most of what the Fed did saved our cookies. It wasn't sufficient necessarily to bring prosperity, but it was necessary, I think, to avoid calamity. Uh, and that's especially true of their earlier actions. Let me just review. First came the rapid reduction in interest rates during 2008 and 2009. And then, after interest rates were as low as they could go, massive quantitative easing, first to unfreeze the frozen uh, financial markets, uh, commercial paper, mortgage-backed securities, and so forth. That later was dubbed QE1, quantitative easing number one, which was a very unfortunate term because it reminded everybody of the Queen Elizabeth one and this huge thing. And because it got a label, I think it got a lot more criticism uh, than it deserved. Uh, when that ran out, the market started tanking, and so the Fed came back with what came to be known as quantitative easing 2, QE2, which was the purchase of treasury bonds uh, to support the, uh, the market. And then when that ran out, market started to tank, so the Fed came back with something called Operation Twist where it basically bought longer-term treasury securities and sold shorter-term. No net impact on their holdings, but the idea was to put downward pressure on longer-term interest rates as being more important for the recovery. 
Now, Operation Twist is scheduled to conclude in June, and the big question on everybody's mind, and the big question next week at the FOMC meeting will be, did they just let it expire and do nothing? Did they renew it? Did they replace it with something called QE3, or what? Um, the financial heads on, on TV all are in agreement that it should not do anything. Although every time Mr. Bernanke says something that suggests that he might not do anything, the stock market goes down. So investors clearly want the Fed to keep the training wheels on just a little longer. Now, all through this, the Fed's balance sheet grew from about $800 billion to almost $3 trillion. Normally, that would be highly inflationary. Normally, it would do a lot of damage to the dollar. And people have been predicting that it was going to be highly inflationary and, and crash the dollar since the beginning. The evidence to the contrary doesn't seem to matter. Inflation right now is barely above 2%. 2% is the official Fed inflation target. And while the dollar index has gone up and down, it basically is at the same level it was before the financial crisis. There's been no net decline. Now, why did it not cause massive inflation? I don't want to get too far down into the weeds, but the first answer is that with all that purchasing of debt by the Fed, it didn't create much new money. The reason it didn't is that the reserves that went into the banking system were hoarded by the banking system, not used to make a lot of loans and investments that would create deposit money. So, it's like the system was a little bit constipated at the bank, the bank level. It didn't flow through to a massive money creation. Um, it's easy to look that up and find out that it's true, but you have a lot of people on TV that are still talking about inflation just right around the corner. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be horrible. Uh, so it has not been inflationary yet. It doesn't have to be. What about the dollars? I mentioned the dollar has not gone down net from from where it was before the uh, financial crisis. For it to hurt the dollar, money has to be created, and then the money has to be spent on foreign currencies. If it's not created, it's not being spent on foreign uh, currencies. So, actually, lately, the dollar's actually strengthened because uh, every time things gets worse, get worse abroad, the dollar is considered a safe haven currency much like U.S. Treasury securities are a safe haven currency. Just as a sidebar, here's something that you never hear on CNBC. I can talk about CNBC because I'm a, an exclusive CNBC contributor. Uh, and I argue about these things mainly with Larry Kudlow, who's a good friend of mine, but he's wrong on just about everything that I'm, <laughs> that I'm talking about here. It's Larry Kudlow that keeps talking about King Dollar you know, you've got to have a king dollar, and king dollar, strong dollar, as a solution to every problem. Let me just point out that a strong currency raises our standard of living. It holds down prices, and it keeps exporters' feet to the fire. It holds down import prices, it makes export prices more competitive, and it's just a good thing under normal circumstances. However, if you're in a deep recession and you can't get out of it, a strong dollar makes things worse because it encourages imports and discourages exports. So you've got a trade-off. You need a weak dollar to get out of the recession, and then later you need a stronger dollar uh, to support your standard of, of living. And that distinction is rarely made. The best way to make that distinction is to remember St. Augustine's advice about chastity. Do you remember his famous prayer about chastity? Lord, make me chaste, just not yet. <laughs> Lord, give us a strong dollar, just not yet. Okay, it's not just that, that banks haven't loaned that, that much money uh, because they're hoarding it, scared to death, being beat up by the administration. It's also that people aren't borrowing uh, that much money. Bank Bank lending has started to pick up a little lately, 
And it's conceivable that it will pick up enough that the Fed will need to withdraw some of these reserves. And at that point, it'll get very tricky. And if the Fed blows it, you could have the uh, inflation. But nothing that's happened so far uh, would, would uh, necessarily mean an inflation. Now, here I am. I spent 36 years at the uh, Fed. I spent 14 years as president of the Dallas Fed and member of the FOMC. And what you're thinking is, I'm not going to disagree with anything the Fed has done. So I've looked for areas of disagreement, and I finally found some, just to show you how fair and balanced I am. Some of the things that the Fed have done recently in the name of central bank transparency, I tend to disagree with, uh, namely the publication of the Fed's own forecasts, not, not just collectively, but individual members. I think that was a mistake. And Mr. Bernanke's pronouncements that rates are likely to stay low through 2013, or mid-2013, mid, uh, and then later he changed that to late 2014. I think that's a m mistake. But I've always been against excessive transparency back when we used to debate it in FOMC meetings. And I irritated my colleagues by coming up with a little rhyme on transparency that you're dying to hear. Transparency is certainly a central banker cause, but it reminds me too much of sausages and laws. I think translucence, like my shower door, is a good compromise. It lets in the light, but keeps out the flies. Okay. Now, there's method to Mr. Bernanke's madness about promising low interest rates through 2014. The method is he doesn't have to do anything. As long as the Fed has credibility, that holds down interest rates. It, it, it works. Open mouth policy works if the mouth has credibility. So I give him that. I just think that it gives up too much flexibility. I think when the time comes to take the foot off the accelerator and possibly tap the brake, it'll be harder to do with those promises outstanding than it would otherwise. But it's a judgment call. Now, Mr. Bernanke says he hopes he's wrong about that. He's hope, he hopes the economy improves enough that you don't have to do it through the end of 14. He said that. What I believe is that he secretly expects it to. But he can't say that without interest rates immediately rising. So I think he's being just a little disingenuous by sticking to that 2014 uh, promise when he thinks, I think in my mind, he thinks that it may not take that long. He's a lifelong student of the Great Depression, and that Great Depression was probably over in the mid-30s until two bad things happened. One was the Fed raised reserve requirements and tightened and caused the banks to contract, and the worst thing that happened uh, worse than that, was the government raised taxes significantly in the middle of the Depression, and it caused a double dip, and put those two dips together, and it became the Great Depression. So Mr. Bernanke, being a student of the Great Depression, feels that if he's going to err, he'd rather err on the side of remaining too easy for too long than to err on the side of uh, premature tightening. He's a very creative man. Uh, interest rates have been low since 2008. Any time the Fed pushes down interest rate, it hurts savers while trying to help borrowers and spenders. But people never talked about the saver part of it because it was temporary and it was thought that the greater good would be served by helping the borrowers and the spenders. But if you go from 2008 through 2014, that's way too long to have interest rates as low as they are. A term for it that's being used these days is financial repression. A similar thing was going on in China last time I was there, and they were, they were calling it eating bitterness. We've been eating the bitterness of uh, low interest rates as savers and as investors uh, for a long time, and I'm hoping that Mr. Bernanke could use his creativity to find a way 
not to ease overall monetary policy prematurely, but to keep it fairly relaxed, but within that, find a way to allow interest rates to begin to uh, normalize. As I said, uh, I think he secretly thinks that'll be possible. So, thank you, thank you very much. Cozy up next to you. I don't have a wireless uh, lapel mic, so I'm going to stand next to Bob here. Uh, but now we're going to open it up to the floor for, for questions. Uh, and while we, uh, while you all put the pen to paper and maybe come up with some questions, uh, I'm going to leave with our with our first question, which is uh, Bob. The conventional wisdom is that inflation is is almost uh, a foregone conclusion at this point in time. And I know you spoke about how the banks have been provided this, this stimulus, but they have yet to put it into to the economy. And so that, that suggests that our fate really relies in the hands of the credit committee to the banks themselves, uh, that they become the gatekeeper for inflation or, or not inflation. And so, uh, so with that view in mind, do you think that the bank has the controls and the insights and the political will to retract this stimulus in a quick fashion if they start to see inflation rise? The Fed, you mean? The Fed, yes. <clears throat> I think so. I think, though, that uh, they'll see inflation rise a little bit before they're sure it's, uh, it's f for good. What's happened lately is every time inflation has gone up, it's gone up because of commodity prices. And it's been fairly clear that commodities were in sort of a bubble and, and it would reverse itself. And so far, that's proven uh, to be the case. The last month's inflation rate, the uh, the uh, overall consumer price index was up three tenths of one percent, I believe, and the core without uh, food and energy was up two tenths of a percent, just barely over. Uh, central bankers traditionally want to go to central banker heaven. And the way you go to central banker heaven is to fight inflation. Fighting unemployment needs to be done, but that doesn't take you to central banker heaven. So all if you scratch any central banker, you'll find that he thinks his lifelong reputation depends on low inflation. So yes, I think they will uh, be ready to do what's necessary once inflation starts picking up. But I think they'll wait till they see the whites of its eyes. They won't just do it based on a projection. Sure. <clears throat> So uh, another question, which is this week the, the Chinese uh, took off some of the trading limits related to the yuan, and that has suggested to some people that perhaps they're showing an inclination to allow the yuan to become maybe a global currency by being a market-traded uh, currency. And I think there's, there's an automatic response by many people just directionally saying, uh, we want a strong dollar, right? But that we, as we, you alluded to, there's times you want a strong dollar and there's times you want a weak dollar. And if you kind of apply that to, to the emergence of China as an economy and, and the uh, decoupling or depegging of their, their currency and perhaps that becoming a global currency, uh, do you see that as necessarily being a bad thing for the United States long term? <clears throat> Kudlow and everybody who appears on his show wants a strong dollar except vis-a-vis -vis China. They want a weak dollar vis-a-vis -vis China, but they never say weak dollar. They just say they, they want China to let the yuan appreciate. Uh, what they did this week, as I understand it, was they broadened the daily trading range from a half percentage point to a whole percentage point, allow it to move around a little bit more. That's a good thing. Uh, conventional wisdom these days is that floating exchange rates are the way to go, and that China, by controlling their float, uh, fairly closely is engaged in some sort of evil activity. Well, that evil activity used to be worldwide policy, as you know. So I, I don't think of what they've been doing as currency manipulation uh, uh, so much. For them to have, for the yuan to be a worldwide currency in the same sense that the dollar is, or even the euro is, uh, will require a little bit more than loosening up the trading range. It will require removal of capital controls. Right now, the government does a lot of control over funds that can come into China and funds that can go out of China. They're going to have to trust, trust the markets and keep backing off, but they're moving in the, in the right direction. Also, the timing of this thing was interesting. Uh, we've been wanting them to turn loose of the yuan, thinking that it was going to float up. 
but they just had a trade deficit in February, as you know, which is unusual in China. They have one every February, I think. Uh, I'll explain that in a minute. Uh, so they did this at a time when there wasn't much upward pressure on it. As a matter of fact, that day it went down a little bit. I was in China this, year, this time last year. Well, that's, that's a different story. <laughs> uh, I'm not sure what story I meant to say. I was there one time and I, I visited, the, I visited the, the government agency that actually pegs the currency. Mm -hmm. And I watched their little PowerPoint presentation on it, which was the most boring PowerPoint presentation I've ever seen. And that's saying a lot since I spent so long at the Fed. Uh, and at the end of the thing, they handed me this huge guest book and they asked me would I write something in their guest book. And I thought, oh my God, you know, what, what, what can I say? And I said, congratulations on China's strong growth rate, and may our two currencies remain strong together. <laughs> well, it didn't work out quite that way. <laughs> uh, China's had a, a trade surplus generally for several years, but it's not been that huge. We've had a deficit for many years. Except within that, the U.S. deficit and the China, uh, the bilateral deficit and surplus with China has been big. So, you know, China accounts for more than, uh, for, for, for more than all of our deficit uh, with everybody else. Uh, I mentioned February. I'm, I'm getting all messed up here. They have a holiday in China where um, sometime around February they all go to the old home place and decorate the graves of their ancestors and they put something on the grave for the ancestors to use in the afterlife. And typically they would put something like play money on the grave. Well, when I was there last time, the iPad 2 had just come out and they had these replicas, these pasteboard iPads. And so the favorite thing to put on the grave was the iPad 2. <laughs> And there was a little article in the paper where one guy said, well, I'm just sticking with paper money because my ancestors were kind of old fashioned and I doubt that they can operate an iPad too. <laughs> but anyway, at least for the last two years, when everybody leaves his job and goes to the old home place to put the iPads on the graves, uh, exports have fallen off dramatically and they've switched over temporarily from a surplus to a uh, deficit. Now, I expect they're back to surplus. We just heard that uh, China uh, growth rate came in the other day at 8.1 percent, and of course we die for 8.1 percent. But for China, that represents a bigger decline than it looks, because they always announce their growth rates on a year-over-year -year basis. So if it comes down over the course of a year and gets as low as 8.1 it must mean it was a lot lower than that in the last quarter. So it's a little bit tricky to interpret those, uh, those statistics. Uh, I don't know how many of you have ever been to China, but uh, if you go, you don't usually see the really poor parts of China, and what you see amazes you. I mean, I, uh, I took the fast train uh, from Shanghai to the, uh, some other city, I never can remember the name of that city, last time I was there. And there was high-rise construction, generally apartment buildings, almost the whole way. And uh, it's just amazing what they're doing. That train later wrecked, by the way. I escaped that. Uh, that's, if I answer that long on your next question, this, uh, it's going to be over. <laughs> so are there any questions from the crowd? Actually, wow. if, there's, <clears throat> if there's not one, I mean, Give them a chance. I, 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 they're bound to be. You know, we have uh, the chair. Uh, have a guest with a question, so we'll let him ask first. I have one too. Thank you. I just had a question. If you could comment on the federal stimulus, just the the two. Uh, simplifying my understanding of the two different positions on on the disappointing results of the stimulus. Letting Paul Krugman speak for the one side. He sort of said, I told you so, not big enough, needed to go much bigger to get the impact uh, that you wanted. And I see conservative economists saying, 
not so much a question of the size uh, as it is so much a question of how it was constituted, the mix of, of um, tax cuts versus spending, and then where the spending was targeted, how it was targeted, and then the period over which it was phased in. I was wondering if you could weigh in on, on that discussion, that debate. Uh, yeah, not very intelligently, I'm afraid. Uh, <clears throat> in order to discuss recent policy in this country, you've got to be willing to discuss counterfactuals. And it was clear that that stimulus program, the $858 billion of stimulus, uh, it certainly didn't help much. It probably helped some. I mean, things could have been worse without it. But it was very poorly planned and poorly executed. Uh, Mr. Obama outsourced that to Ms. Pelosi and Mr. Reid. They appeared to just pick old proposals off the shelf that uh, they couldn't get through otherwise and pop them all together. They talked about shovel-ready projects, but there were no shovel-ready uh, projects. I think economic uh, research shows that uh, tax cuts are more stimulative usually than spending increases, and so uh, there probably were, wasn't enough tax cut component of that versus uh, spending component, but it's just poorly designed. And it, uh, it probably did a little good. It's hard to imagine that spending that much extra money didn't stimulate something. And I think what it probably did was it, it delayed the time when state and local governments were having to lay off so many school teachers, policemen, and firemen. They eventually had to get around to doing that, but I think the first beneficial effect of the stimulus was that it, uh, it padded the budgets of the state and local governments and, and delayed that. Uh, let, me, let me just say that TARP, Troubled Asset Relief Program instituted by the Treasury to save the banking system, worked. And as far as the bank's concerned, it made a profit. It didn't cost taxpayers anything. All these uh, investments made by the Fed in growing their balance sheet worked, maybe not as well as they had hoped, but it worked, and it didn't cost the taxpayers anything. As a matter of fact, it, it helped the taxpayer because the Fed turns over its earnings to the Treasury, and by tripling the size of its balance sheet, it tripled the size of its earnings and turns over more. So you, the two big programs that worked did not add to the fiscal problem. Now, the one that didn't work very well was the one that did add to it. And we've, we've already had three annual deficits of over a trillion dollars. I think they've averaged around 1.3 trillion. And we're on course, I think, this year for a $1 trillion deficit. And that's clearly unsustainable. So I guess my verdict on the stimulus program would be it probably worked a little but it probably wasn't worth the fiscal damage that it did. Now, having said that, Paul Krugman is probably right that it was too small back when it was uh, first implemented. And if you read uh, the story, somebody wrote a book about economic policy making during that period, and they went into great detail. And there were people in the administration arguing for a much larger program, and, and they didn't think they'd get anything over a trillion dollars through Congress, so they settled on something uh, other than a trillion. Perhaps two unrelated questions. One is, how big a worry should we have on the 15 or 16 trillion dollar debt that we're carrying? And secondly, why are congressmen worried about Roger Clements using steroids? <laughs> Two good questions. Uh, I agree with Ron Paul on steroids, I think. Uh, you know, every year that you run a deficit, it adds that much to the outstanding debt. And going into this crisis, our debt was about 40% of GDP. What is it now, about 80%? I think it's even oh. higher than that. Maybe even well, it depends on whether you count the debt held by government agencies right. or it's gross. 
I like the net better than the growth. Uh, so it's on an unsustainable path. Uh, I don't know if you ever get a heart attack from it. It may just be cancer that slowly uh, debilitates your, your government. I mean, as the debt gets bigger, a larger and larger fraction of government spending has to go to servicing it. And so that's money that can't be uh, spent elsewhere. And before we worry about the size of the debt, though, let's quit adding so much to it each year. I mean, we need to get our annual deficits down to closer to where they used to be. That won't shrink the debt, but it will allow the country's GDP growth to catch up a little bit. You don't really have to get rid of the debt if you can get your, your country growing fast enough so that as a percentage of the economy, it gets smaller, even if absolutely it doesn't. Uh, but, you know, the, there's no low-hanging fruit uh, to speak of. I guess the lowest hanging fruit to me would be a corporate tax cut. I think probably that would have Laffer curve effects and increase tax revenues if we cut corporate taxes. It would, and it would enable corporations to bring home money they've earned abroad and it's sort of stranded abroad because of the high tax rate. We now have the highest corporate tax rate in the world at 35%. Now, I understand that there are a lot of loopholes that means that the effective tax rate's not nearly as high as 35%. So the Republicans want to lower the corporate rate and maybe do a little something with some of the loopholes. Obama has offered to lower the corporate rate, but he wants to eliminate so many loopholes that it actually raises corporate taxes <laughs> effectively. Uh, so you've got to watch the P, see which shell it's, it's under. That's a, that's a low-hanging uh, piece of fruit. The big, the big thing that's coming up, though, is uh, sequestration, where all the Bush tax cuts go away. That doesn't raise the capital gains tax rate up to 35%, but it, it raises the uh, dividends rate up to the same as, as ordinary income. That would be very, very uh, damaging. Take a little different, if I'm correct, and you, you correct me if I'm wrong here, take a more aggressive view than you in terms of debt reduction. And sooner and larger, I think, than my, my sense of what you're talking about. Any observation there? Well, John Taylor became a lot more conservative in that regard back when Kudlow was on his campaign to keep Bernanke from being reappointed. Kudlow decided that John Taylor would be the appropriate person to take his place. So he started sounding like the main way to increase tax revenues is to cut taxes. And that only works, even according to Arthur Laffer, at the very highest rates. And it works if, if taxes are 72 percent, you can probably cut them down to 50 and it will increase tax revenue. But if taxes are 35 percent, cutting it to 25 percent may not have much uh, of an effect. John Taylor is known for the Taylor Rule, as you obviously know since you know these guys, uh, which is a sort of a formula that applied after the fact, sort of described U.S. monetary policy over many years. And uh, somewhere during the middle of this crisis, the actual monetary policy started deviating from the Taylor Rule, because the Taylor Rule didn't have a financial crisis built, uh, built into it. You mentioned uh, Boskin. Now, he's, is he at the Hoover Institute? He, he teaches at Harvard, right? No, I'm, I'm getting him. Oh, I'm confusing him with Greg Mankiw. I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure exactly what his his view is on all these all these things. But there is a, a noticeable difference between 
financial TV economist who are the most extreme, then the think tank economists who are almost as extreme, and academic economists who believe almost the opposite of what the first of these. They're represented by Paul Krugman. Krugman's in the mainstream of most academic economists. He's just on the fringes uh, for people like us, I'm guessing. I don't know you. Except you're all going to be hit with the Buffett rule, right? <laughs> uh, you actually mentioned something very interesting about uh, Greg Mankey that uh, I guess Romney today presented that his new economic council, uh, and it's going to include, include Greg Mankey and Glenn Hubbard. Do you have any perspectives on, on will that be a material well, shift? I love uh, Greg Mankey because he just put me in his latest book. Um, <laughs> his, back in uh, February, I think, of 2011, he was coming out with, I think, the 13th edition of his textbook. He has a hardback and a softback version of it. And I get this email from the publishing company wanting my permission uh, to include a portion of a commencement address I made to the economics graduates at the University of Texas. And uh, I said, well, are you paying? And she said, uh, yeah, we'd be happy to accept it as a donation, but if, if you prefer to be paid, we'll do that. And I said, well, what are you paying? Well, we've got this auction, this, uh, forget what she called it. What, what is Dick Army's thing on closing army bases called? Well, anyway, she said the going rate, right, what, the, what, what it meant was they would pay everybody the price they agreed to pay anybody, most favored nation is the term I was looking for. And she said it was at $1,000 now. And I said, well, I'll take the $1,000, but if he decides that it's not worth it, I'll drop it to zero. <laughs> <laughs> I want him to use it. And uh, what it was was a, a commencement address where I told the students all the things they knew and could understand better than most people because they'd uh, studied economics. And... Uh, he put a good bit of it in there, but uh, it only amounted to about a quarter of the, uh, of the total. But it's still, it's still in there, and that's the, that's the uh, biggest selling. It's the new Paul Samuelson. It's the biggest selling textbook. And my uh, granddaughter had it at uh, George Mason University, and, uh, which was kind of cool. You didn't know I had a granddaughter in, in university, right? <laughs> because I look too young for that. <laughs> uh, do you think that the, the Fed has enough tools in its arsenal to try and manage an economy in such a um, prolonged downturn uh, when, the, like when the Fed fund rate is, is next to zero? Yeah, my, my answer is probably but I say that because I've always thought of Fed monetary policy primarily in terms of the money supply growth. Milton Friedman was my uh, guru on that. And I think they are more, the growth of the money supply is more important than changes in interest rates. And the Fed's out of interest rate ammunition, but it's got unlimited power to create money. Uh, now, the money creation is, is getting to be a little harder, and people are not responding to it quite as aggressively as they used to. But uh, Kudlow used to talk about, well, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. I say, yeah, but Larry, the solution is not to take the water away. It's to add more water with a little punch. But uh, the Fed's arsenal is, is diminished but I think it's sufficient. Now, one thing the Fed still has, despite all the talk about it, is credibility. So that when Mr. Bernanke says, we got your back, the 10-year bond rate goes below 2%. That's credibility. Now, in the next several months, if the economy strengthens or if inflation picks up much, the bond vigilantes are going to drive that 10-year bond rate up to 3%, maybe beyond, whether Mr. Bernanke like, likes it or not. So he can lose what, what little uh, 
influence he has over longer term interest rates pretty easily if, if what he's trying to do gets too far out of sync uh, with the economy. But he would still have the ability to keep short term interest rates uh, uh, low. So I think we have time for one more question. Thank you. I've heard some talk of maybe shifting to a more, a more of a VAT value added tax on the federal level. Is that even realistic or is that just you know, lipstick on a pig? I'm not sure it's lipstick. Uh, the problem, uh, there's some advantages to a value added tax. Some people would say an advantage is you don't see it because it's done in stages at different stage of, of production and by the time the production process is complete, it's all embedded. And I would, I would say rather than advantage, that's a disadvantage because we're not going to fight it as much if, if we can't see it. Milton Friedman, my hero, had one regret in his professional life and that is he helped design the system of tax withholding for the federal government. And he later decided that was a mistake because it made it too easy uh, to hide the taxes. I mean, you know, we, we tend to think of our taxes as what we have to pay or get back at tax day and, and forget how much was taken out throughout the, uh, uh, throughout the year. Another advantage of value added tax is apparently you can, uh, uh, it doesn't raise the price of your exports as much as other taxes do. It will help your exports. I'm not sure how that gets around WTO rules, but uh, Europe seems to use it uh, to its advantage. Uh, if, if I could start over on the tax system, I'd have the fair tax or consumption tax. Uh, why tax capital? And why not let people earn all they can earn without a tax disincentive to earn it? and then just pay taxes on what they spend on consumption. Uh, two friends of mine uh, devised the fair tax version of, of that consumption tax. And years ago, they asked me to get an appointment with Milton Friedman so they could pitch that to him. So I went with them out to California and we visited with Milton and Rose Friedman in their, in their apartment overlooking the bay. And there was Milton Friedman's Nobel Prize hanging on the on the wall, Rose served cookies and milk. Later, uh, the Dallas Fed, when I was still there, had a conference honoring the 25th anniversary of their book and TV series, Free to Choose. And they both came, and I asked Rose, uh, were those really homemade cookies that you served that day? And she said, if I served them, they were homemade. Well, Bob, thank you for being here. I'd like to thank you and thank the NCPA. We appreciate you all being here, and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you at our next lecture series. So thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.